Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to session two of our Dementia um, Demystifying two-part webinar series. My name is Whitney Flower. I'm a Workforce Development and Project Officer at West Vic PHN. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in, zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience, and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to any First Nations peoples coming in today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The majority of our webinar events are recorded, as Jenny was just saying, um, and they're freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. Um, I'll just put the link in the chat for you. Um, yes, yeah, so the link's in the chat. And um, on the screen, there's also our upcoming events. Um, you can register for the events on our website and that link is also in the chat. Um, a special mention for our upcoming primary care conference. This is a hybrid conference where you can attend from Geelong, Horsham, Warrnambool, or Ballarat venues, or you can also dial in remotely. Um, the theme for 2023 is toddler and teen health, and the registrations opened on the 3rd of April. So you'll be able to find them on the events page um, in the previous link, or it's also in the um, slides, which will be available in the post-session email. Um, please make note of our health pathways and they're on the screen now. Um, these are the new dementia pathways um, developed in this dementia project. Um, Westwick PHN received funding from the Commonwealth to develop a resource for consumers, people with dementia and their family and carers, outlining local services and supports. Research by Dementia Australia has found that People are often overwhelmed around the time of diagnosis and want something they can take away and refer back to over time. This brochure includes the main national helplines like Dementia Australia, Care Gateway and My Age Care, as well as a QR code to access a local service directory. The consumer resource can be printed out and given to your patients. If you would like hard copies, please email the Health Pathways and I'll just put the link to the Health Pathways and their email in the chat also. Um, and lastly, um, please complete this short evaluation. Um, we'll really appreciate it. And I'll post that link in the chat also. And over to you, Jenny. Stop Thank you, Whitney. Sorry. That's okay. Ta -da, and we're back again. <laughs> okay, thank you, Whitney, for, for that introduction. And a few people have arrived in the meantime. So as I said before, please feel free to have your cameras on if that's comfortable for you. Our, power, power, our PowerPoint will go up and down as we move through the content. Um, please feel free to use the chat because the guys will keep an eye on that. But if not, um, you know, asking questions or making a comment, perhaps keep yourself um, on mute would be fabulous. So I'm going to hand over to Hilton, who will introduce the rest of the team and start the evening. Thank you, Hilton. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Whitney, for making us welcome. My name's Hilton Coppy. I'm a GP from Lennox Head in northern New South Wales. And I also worked on our health pathways for many, many years. So congratulations, Whitney, to you. Uh, your PHN in updating your dementia and cognitive impairment health pathway. I'm a big fan of health pathways and uh, it's great that um, you've been working in that area. And also congratulations, Whitney, on the consumer resources for people around the time of diagnosis, because we all know that that's such a challenging time for people. And it's great that you've got some local resources to help in that regard. Um, 
Jenny's in mission control tonight and doing a fantastic job. She's always so welcoming. So as she said, if you'd like to have your cameras on, that's really nice. Um, some of you have used the chat box to say where you're from and what your professional background is. That really helps us. So if you're willing to do that, that is great. Um, during the session, we kind of we love doing face to face, but we can't all be where you all are. So here we are and there you are. But if you'd like to ask questions, please use the chat box to do that. But of course, you can unmute yourself and turn your camera on and we'll take that as a clue that you'd like to ask a question in the old fashioned, like, you know, talking way that we used to do before we had all these Zoom things. So. Uh, we welcome that. Please feel comfortable to do that at any time. So, Jenny, are you ready? Let's start sharing the screen, please. And tonight's session is session two of Dementia Demystified. I think you would have all met Marita last time. Marita Long is sitting in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Are you there, Marita? Yeah. Yeah, great. Nice to see you again. Marita's the GP and part of the Dementia Training Australia GP education team. And also sitting just north of me in Brisbane is Karen. Do you want to say hi Good again? Good evening. Yes. Karen. Yeah, great. So, uh, it's nice that I can join you all tonight. So let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny. So uh, as always, um, we like to acknowledge the people who've been involved in developing this program that we're sharing with you tonight. Their names are on the screen there. And we're part of the Dementia Training Australia GP education team, which has got one of the very few evidence-based education programs on anything in primary care, let alone dementia. Uh, and we're very happy to be able to share with you information that has a very solid research base in knowing that what we offer actually makes a difference, plus is based on the most up-to-date and current research and information regarding dementia. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny. So, because uh, we're so educationally sound, uh, we do have some learning outcomes, which you can read on the screen. I know that many of you come from different backgrounds. There's some GPs and other primary health care providers. We're trying very much to make what we're offering tonight applicable to all of you, no matter where you work. Although we do have a bias because Marita, Karen, myself are GPs. So it is through the lens of working in general practice but I think the materials that we're gonna offer uh, will be of value to many of you who are, or hopefully all of you who are working in the primary care setting. Next slide, please, Jenny. Now I've got a very short attention span. And so I like to get the key message right at the very start. I don't know if any of you have short attention spans or maybe are tired. And um, so anyway, here are the things that we're hoping that you will remember about tonight's session, that in many situations, the GP is able to both diagnose and initiate care for people living with dementia, that a timely diagnosis improve outcomes for both the person living with dementia and their family and carers. And this is really a very important one, that although there are no curative treatments for dementia, there are many interventions that all of you who are here tonight can utilize to help improve the quality of life of people living with dementia and their family and carers. Next slide, please, Jenny. Okay. So we're gonna do a quick refresh for those of you who like me find it hard to get these new concepts into the head. So Marita, can you briefly run over for us the domains which was discussed at the webinar last time? Yeah, so we can remember or recall that there are only five domains we need to try and remember. The first one being cognition. And we often think about memory. That's what everyone thinks about when we think about dementia. But we um, need to be reminded that there's 
or the other aspects to think about. So that could include people who um, are having trouble, for example, following the thread of a story or a TV show, someone who could watch a TV show, but now is always like, or who's that person again? Or what happened just then? Or having trouble, for example, following a book. It might be that while their memory is not too bad, actually, they might um, be making some poor decisions, poor financial decisions, for example, or it might be that they really have, have lost their sense of judgment or lost a sense of insight. So it's broader than memory. Functional decline is what we see paralleling the cognitive decline. And that's where people are starting not to be able to do things that they were used to doing. So, for example, following a recipe becomes hard or cooking dinner becomes hard, using things like your microwave or having to get someone help you um, with your banking because you forget the pin or you've forgotten how to use the auto bank or you've forgotten how to use the washing machine. So there can be that functional decline. And remember with the psychiatric symptoms, we talked about the fact that they can uh, wax and wane in and out of the course of the illness. Um, depression and anxiety, for example, can be very on very early on when people are starting to recognize something's not quite right. Or remember, we said most people will at some point experience hallucinations or delusions. And those halluc whose hallucinations may not be that troubling for some people with dementia, and they may not mention them. So it's always really important to ask about them. Delusions can be quite quite um, scary and quite frightening for people, particularly I remember my dad had a short phase while well, he had dementia where he really thought um, my eldest brother was trying to harm him. It's incredibly distressing for both him and my brother. So the delusions can be a little bit more um, disturbing. The behaviour changes, we talked about the fact that we sort of associate them as some of the challenging behaviours, so wandering or becoming aggressive or agitated. But remember in the early phases of the illness there might be a change in behavior like apathy where people don't seem so interested in things they've always been interested in in the past past and physical declines we also think about those end stages where people are no longer um, mobile or they might have swallowing difficulties or continence but sometimes those physical um, signs are there early as well with a slowness or a change in gait for example so they're the five domains to think about. And remember, we said they're quite useful when you're taking a history just to guide the sort of questions you might want to ask. Because history is so important in the assessment of uh, someone with a possible dementia. Jenny, let's go on to the next slide. And Karen, you've got the talking stick now. If you could just remind us about the stages, how we think about that in thinking about people with dementia. So we really we've got three stages. So rather than we spoke last time, rather than calling it mild, moderate and severe, because we don't feel that even around the time of diagnosis that um, anyone would think that that's mild. So we talk about stage one, two and three. And stage one's really when um, the person living with dementia is still at home. So starting to see some of those cognitive and functional changes um, you know, starting to need a little bit more assistance, but still reasonably independent. And then stage two is as those needs really start changing. Um, and often it's some of the behaviours or things that drive people into hospital and then uh, into further care um, around that stage two. And stage three is really towards the end stage of time of dementia, where we're really seeing significant physical decline, very uh, significant cognitive decline, and really looking at more of those comfort cares at that stage. So it's really, again, helps us think about our management and our goals of care, which change depending on which stage uh, people are in. And we're going to get to the goals of care uh, very, very soon. So thanks for raising that, Karen. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny, which is my favourite slide in the whole deck because it puts together the five domains and the three stages in a graphic way. Uh, uh, and it shows the, the changes in cognition and function over time. The psychiatric manifestations, as Marita mentioned, can come and go at any time. Uh, so we've represented that with a squiggly line across the middle. Uh, the behaviour changes, Jenny, we need to change this slide, don't we, to um, have the behaviour change start a little bit earlier to that it's a more gradual onset, perhaps around the end of stage one. And then as the physical decline increases, 
often the behavioural changes will decline a little bit, primarily because people aren't able to move and, and uh, wander as much because of their physical decline. The other thing I really like about this slide is you'll notice between stage two and stage three on the graph, it's really messy. And that's like a metaphor for how it often is for people's lives at that time, which is why we're so keen on a diagnosis being made earlier in stage one so that planning can be in place for that difficult time of transitioning between stage two and stage three. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm sure at the last session, you would have covered the four inclusion criteria. So this is just a reminder because we're gonna be looking at uh, our patient, Anna, and seeing if she meets these four inclusion criteria in a moment. So a gradual onset of poor memory, worsening that's getting worse, and it's associated with a functional decline or failure of function and some evidence of cortical dysfunction as well. So these are the four inclusion criteria. And Jenny, then the next slide, the three exclusion criteria, we need to make sure that the person doesn't have a delirium, that there are no other organic causes for their symptoms, including drugs, and that they don't have an indicator of psychiatric illness. If any of these are present, they're treated as best as possible, and then the person is reviewed for the inclusion criteria. All right, Marita, did we cover everything that was covered last week, last yeah, time? Yep. Yeah. Okay, now we're gonna do some new stuff. So pay attention, stay awake. This is new material, having done the refresher. Let's go into the next slide. And part of, although this is management, the things of this session, the things about risk reduction and management are almost identical, almost identical. So before we get onto the specifics of the management of someone with a dementia, we like to talk about what things that we can do as primary health practitioners to help reduce the risk. So Marita, would you like to run us through these? Please? Yeah, so I guess the big message is, um, you know, there are no curative treatments. Um, so really what we want to be doing uh, as much as anything now is looking at preventing or reducing people's risk of dementia. And the big message is that it's never too early or never too late to do this. So we know that um, really dementia is, is a chronic disease and the pathology for the disease probably starts 20 to 30 years before we sort of see any um, clinical signs of it. So we've got a real opportunity for um, people in their midlife stages to start thinking about um, brain health checks. There's probably about 40% of um, dementias globally that can be prevented um, by really honing in and targeting on, on some uh, modifiable risk factors. And I think it's really important that we start thinking about this, particularly in terms of women, because we know women are more likely to be diagnosed with dementia than men. So if we go on to the next slide, we can see that um, the risk factors that we're going to be talking about either work to reduce the um, abnormal pathological process or they work to increase or optimise our cognitive reserve or some, in fact, will target both in terms of reducing people's risk of dementia. So if we go into the next slide, and I'm going to talk about them more specifically then. So what I guess we're thinking about in DTA for in general practice, how do we actually uh, initiate the process of a brain health check and we can do it lifelong we don't have a heart health check like we do for cardiovascular disease but we do have the good old 45 to 49 year check which just happens to be in midlife which just happens to be when this pathology is starting so we're suggesting that we incorporate a brain health check at least at the 45 to 49 year health check and if we just click again for me jenny one of the reasons being it's great to be able to talk about dementia prevention because it starts to normalise it, I guess, or reduce the stigma. If we start to talk about brain health at this stage, we might find that our over 75-year-olds aren't so um, stressed about talking about brain health. Then I've got a, a patient who turned 87 this week and every time she comes in to see me, she says, um, John, 
Brown, 42 West Street, Kensington. Have I still got it, Marita? Okay, you still got it. So she gets very anxious about it. So we start normalizing it young. Great opportunity. If we go into the next slide. So th this is now going through the 12 um, known modifiable risk factors. And the first one is about um, early educational attainment. So this is something I think as GPs we do well. We start that with our antenatal care. We do it with our developmental checks. If kids have poor hearing, we make sure that they um, get sent off to ENT and have tubes put in it's put in. So that's early education. But education along the way is always going to be helpful. Next click, please, Jenny. Now, these are some of the modifiable risk factors that they group into sort of later life. So for the over 65s, and that's where the research comes from. But it makes sense that we're going to be looking at all these things also in that lifelong phase. So managing diabetes, optimizing our HbA1cs, our sugar control. If someone's depressed, we know that's a risk factor. So we treat depression as best we can. Air pollution, while we may not do that so much in our offices, we do know that we've got a group of great um, GPs out there who are really fighting a lot of the climate change. Social isolation, again, that's something that we're throughout the course life trying to ensure that people are socially engaged. And we now have a special interest group for social prescribing. So we're starting to really recognise the importance of that. Smoking cessation, we talk about every day in general general practice, again, across all stages. And then physical activity is really important. And I'm going to come back to that just quickly in a minute. But if we could just click the next slide. These are the um, modifiable risk factors here in the blue that we're really targeting in that midlife. And interesting hearing loss, you wouldn't think that that would be an issue in midlife, you'd be thinking of that a lot older. But we definitely know that hearing loss and um, encouraging people to think about that and to think about um, having hearing aids so that they stay socially engaged. That's probably one of the reasons why hearing contributes so much to the um, cause of dementia. Midlife hypertension, very important. I'd put my first, first put my hand up to say I haven't been probably super aggressive in, in looking at um, hypertension, particularly for women. I think we always think about it with men. But we're looking at targets for dementia prevention, probably under 130 on 80. Traumatic brain injury, thinking about the sports related injuries. People have had falls, um, falling off horses, bikes, those kind of things. Obesity, we're sort of challenging that across the life spectrum uh, for lots of people now. And um, alcohol reduction. There's no safe level of alcohol, but we generally advise sticking to the recommendation of no more than two standard drinks a day. Now, obesity and physical activity are there bolded because they're probably the two biggest risk factors uh, in countries like Australia. Just the next click on that, please. So sleep and diet, whilst they're not in the modifiable risk factors, we do have good evidence that they do contribute. So that good sleep is really, really important. And most of our evidence is for uh, Mediterranean diet diet. And just on the right of that slide, just to keep in mind that these risk reduction strategies, well, strategies, while we're working with the person sitting in front of us, remember that there does need to be that overall population look. It's very hard to say to someone, um, you know, you, what you have to do is stop drinking, eat better, move more. We know that there's lots of structural things that can make it very hard for the people that we're working with. So it's trying to work together, pick pick the one thing where they could make a change because even changing one thing will make a difference. Marita, that was so comprehensive. Did you just make this stuff up or does it actually come from somewhere else? These oh, I, no, I, just, I just pulled them out of my hat today. I thought, what am I going to talk about today? Now, yeah. These are all from the Lancet Commission of um, 2020. So they've identified these 12 modifiable risk factors, although, as I said, sleep and diet are very important. They, they just haven't made it to the list yet. But they are going to, and we've, we're working with people in Australia who have done some fantastic research around sleep and diet to, um, as modifiable risk factors. So Karen, I know you've worked as a GP for many years, and I imagine, like I'm just making this up, but I imagine sometimes uh, it may be challenging with some of your patients in midlife to motivate them to do exercise or stop smoking or, or reduce their... Has that ever happened for you, Karen? Yes, it has. <laughs> and since you've started thinking about brain health checks and using these interventions 
uh, and explaining to people that they may be helpful in also not only reducing your risk of heart disease, but reducing your risk of dementia. Have you noticed anything different happen with your patients once they're aware that this might reduce their risk of dementia? Certainly anyone that's got a family history or has had someone that they know, um, definitely yes is motivating and particularly hearing actually I've found that that's really been a motivation for people to go and get checked or go and um, actually they know their hearing is not so good so I actually go and do something about it. Not only so they can hear the conversations or stop annoying their partner but it may reduce their risk of mm. developing a dementia right? Exactly. Yeah, because rightly or wrongly, there is a stigma around dementia and there is a great deal of fear. And while we don't want fear to be the major motivating factor, as Marita said, if you can find the one thing out of this list that someone's likely to do to change what they're, the way they're living their life to reduce their risk of dementia and heart disease, well, then that's going to be a good outcome. So Jenny, um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, Marita, can you just explain to us how the COG-D risk can be helpful in clinical practice to, uh, so that we don't have to remember all these things? Yeah, so I think um, what's really useful about the COG-D risk, if you do your 45 to 49 year health check and you identify that somebody does have a couple of risks there for um, dementia or they're you know, they have had a parent and they are really worried about their personal risk. This COGD risk is an online tool, an evidence-based tool that you can either sit with the patient and do if you want to, or you can get them to go home and do it depending on how good they are with using online tools. And they can work their way through it. And then at the end of um, all the questions, it actually gives you a really lovely report with where your sort of protective factors are, where the personal risk factors are, and then you've kind of got a starting point then. And it's even simple things like, um, you know, it might be that you should increase the amount of fish you're eating if we're thinking about diet, or you might need to think about your physical activity or doing some um, cognitive mind skills training. And so it gives you a really nice starting point to work with people. And then there's also some terrific um, fact sheets for GPs or for anyone in primary care that you can download for your um, patient around some particular risks, not all of the 12 risk factors, and they're in multiple languages. So this website, Neura, with these two um, uh, online resources are terrific, and I've found them incredibly useful. They are working on a shorter COGD risk now, so it doesn't take the 20 to 30 minutes, um, and that'll probably take another 12, 24 months to be developed, but I've found this super useful. And people can do it themselves, right? Like yeah. you don't have to do it with them in the, in the surgery. Oh, no, yeah, or you could do it with a practice nurse or they, they can do it themselves and, and come back with yeah. a report. Uh, did, did these people just make this up, Marita? Uh, yeah, again, just decided they'd do something that looked pretty. No, look, these are all evidence-based and the result of, you know, years and years of, um, very clever people putting these tools together. And developed in Australia. So that's another really good thing about this, that it's uh, evidence-based, solid advice that we can offer for people that, that's based in Australia. Um, now, I have seen a total absence of questions or comments in the chat box. So that either means that we're doing such a fantastic job that everything is very clear, or it's really bad and no one's paying attention and has any questions. So uh, please um, humor us into thinking you're engaged by asking questions as we go. Surely we must stimulate some thinking for you um, uh, as, as we're going. So that's a positive comment. Thank you for that, Kylie, that's great. All right, Jenny, while um, people are busily writing in the chat box, let's get back to uh, the patient that um, I think you met last time, Anna. And just to remind you all, Anna's 75. She came to see her GP, Dr. George, who some of you might recognize as being um, someone fairly familiar, but anyway, we'll just skip over that. And, um, 
and she's got hypertension and osteoarthritis. And unlike any of my actual 75 year old patients, she's only on perindopril for blood pressure and paracetamol for her arthritis. Let's go to the next slide, Jenny. So um, you might recall that her examination was normal for her age, her blood test and her CT brain were normal. Her MMSE score was 23. Karen, what's your response to an MMSE score of 23? What does that mean to you? Uh, it certainly means that she's got some cognitive impairment. Um, so I'm certainly going to look, look a bit further into what's going on. Yeah, and on that day, she scored poorly on that day. Maybe she was tired or maybe that's just how she always is. But at that time, there was some evidence of cognitive impairment in that time. She also has dysphagia and agnosia, mild dysphagia and agnosia. Uh, and thankfully, she wasn't depressed or her geriatric depression score was normal. So, Jenny, if we can go into the next slide. Thank you. If we think back to the four inclusion criteria, she had a gradual onset of poor memory that was getting worse. There was some failure of function that she wasn't doing her gardening, cooking or socializing. And she had the dysphagia and the agnosia. So Marita, if you saw someone like Anna, oh, let's just do the next slide first quickly, Jenny, sorry. And she had none of the exclusion criteria. So Marita, if you saw someone like Anna in your practice, what might you think was going on? Uh, I think that I'd be fairly confident after that to say that Anna has dementia. Yep. Okay. So um, there are some good questions coming in. We're just going to uh, put them on hold for a minute but we will get back to them. So don't think that we're ignoring you having asked you to write the questions. Some of them will be answered as we go along. So um, Marita, would you feel confident in sharing that diagnosis with Anna and her daughter, Sophie, in general practice? Yeah, I think, you know, having done gone through all those steps and processes and looked through, through our domains to get the history and think, think about where she might be in a stage and knowing that she's met those four inclusion criteria and she doesn't have any of the exclusion criteria, I'd be feeling confident to organise a follow-up appointment with Anna and Sophie and um, to deliver the diagnosis. All right. Well, uh... Luckily for you, Anna wasn't your patient, but she was Dr. George's patient. And doctor, that's exactly what Dr. George did. So in a minute, we'll watch the video of Dr. George offering the gift of the diagnosis. And as we do that, Karen, I'm going to ask you um, afterwards, what did you think Dr. George did well? What might he have done differently, if anything? And would you have done anything differently? Um, but let's focus. Yeah, so we'll ask you, Karen, after we've watched the video. So Karen, let's... Uh, Jenny, let's watch the video, please. Right, I'm just stopping that. And just so that you can keep those questions in mind, I'm going to pop them into the chat. And you can have a little look at those whilst I just double check that the video is good to go. And it appears, do, 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 do. Bear with me, just talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, I'm going to just reflect on that a bit more too, Hilton, to say about the confidence factor of giving the diagnosis. It would always be nicer if there was a really clear diagnostic test that we had and we could say, you know, 100%, here's the test that shows that you have um, dementia or here's the, you know, scan that definitely confirms it. At this point in time, we just don't have that. So it is that thing. So I understand, you know, it takes a while to feel that confidence without having the, you know, the little test sitting in front of you to say this is 100%, um, mm. you know, confirming a diagnosis. It is always hard. We don't expect people to do this workshop and go away and go, oh, yeah, I've nailed it now. I can just give that diagnosis. It, it is, it's a process to get really familiar with, isn't it? Yeah, definitely it takes time. But um, sometimes... Let's jump to George. Yeah, see how Dr. George goes. Thanks. Here we go. 
So Anna, I've had a good look at all of your results and I'm pleased to say the blood tests are all completely normal and the brain scan showed no sign of a brain tumour. Okay, great. But what that means is that the likely diagnosis for the cause of the changes that have occurred for you over the last six to 12 months is a form of dementia. So like, um, that's like Alzheimer's. Like Alzheimer's. Thanks, Jenny, for relieving us of the need to look at Dr. George for one moment longer. So Karen, what did you think, Dr. good old Dr. George, who tries so hard, what do you think that he might have done well in this situation? I think he was certainly very respectful. Um, he didn't beat around the bush and leave Sophie and Anna hanging on what the diagnosis might be. He, he answered her concerns, which I know from a previous video was that she had a brain that she had a brain tumor. So he did actually answer that up front. But I really love the way he broke the bad news. So being able to give the diagnosis and then just waiting, just pausing and seeing what came back from the patient, or in fact, from her daughter. Yeah, so what came back was a question, wasn't it? Yeah. Like Alzheimer's, question mark. And Dr. George used Sophie's words and said, like Alzheimer's, but as a statement with a exclamation mark at the end. Yeah, Marita, we've done this um, exercise with uh, hundreds of doctors now over the years and given them the opportunity to uh, offer the gift of the diagnosis of dementia. How do, how do things normally go before they have a chance to watch that video? What do, what do we observe? Yeah, it's really the same pretty much every time. And it's where the doctor will say to um, Anna and, and the daughter, because they're all in a role play, well, it looks like you might have, you could have, um, your, your memory's probably not that great. Um, you could, you, there's some evidence that you could have some cognitive um, change. It's really hard to get the D word out. It's just really hard to say that word. And again, I think a lot of that is because you feel like you can't have this 100% sort of test there in front of you to say this is what it is. Unlike you know, a, a breast cancer, which is much easier to be able to give that diagnosis because everything's sitting there in front of you. But they really, really struggle. But then after the video, the opportunity to watch that video and rethink it, um, it comes out a lot easier. Mm. And I'm old enough to have been a GP for many years when another D word was one that we struggled with. I don't know if there's any other GPs in the room who re might remember the word depression, there's no specific test for that. And we didn't used to like to use that word, but through the process of education and familiarizing uh, primary care clinicians and community destigmatizing depression, now it's much easier to use that D word. So uh, that's part of our mission is to destigmatize this and to help people feel more comfortable around brain health and dementia. Uh, does anyone, while we've got the slides off, does anyone have any questions or comments that they like to ask in the old fashioned way of like talking? Well, people are thinking, Hilton, I was just going to say uh, the other thing that we notice in the role play, if you do eventually come around to saying something about cognitive impairment, is then lots of information comes out. Uh, so rather than sitting with that discomfort and seeing what the patient knows, often uh, our doctors feel they've really got to let, let the patient know everything all at once. Yeah, but it doesn't all need to be done, done at once, right? Yeah, take time. All right. Um, Let's get the slides back up, Jenny. And uh, let's click through to the next one. Okay, so we spoke earlier about the um, stages of dementia. Now we're um, gonna talk about goals of care. Now, Karen, you mentioned goals of care earlier. Can you remind us of 
how we use the stages to help us figure out the goals of care for the, um, for, well, for the different stages. Yeah, and we know that our management plans or our goals or the patient goals are quite different depending on what stage uh, people are in. So while we have someone still living at home, our goal of care is really that dignity by keeping them as independent as we can, being able to maintain their social connections, enjoyment, all of those things, keeping them physically active, things that might slow the progression if possible, but also continue with that dignity. The second stage then, we're really looking at trying to keep people safe. And that's when we might be starting to think about, you know, what is it? Sophie was, uh, you know, leaving, and it was leaving the stove on and having difficulty with the gardening. So some of those safety uh, things become more paramount in that second stage. By the third stage, we're really looking at comfort, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, we've got, you know, pressure care and watching how they're eating and managing with food, um, you know, and often that's requiring 24 care um, in, a, in a residential care facility, but really looking at still maintaining dignity in that, in that stage. Through comfort, yeah. yeah. So the, the dignity is the theme that that runs through. So we're going to um, move on to look at the things that we might do to help someone like Anna in stage one, using coming back to the domains to help guide the management for someone in stage one dementia like Anna. But before we go on to that, Marita, there was a question about the risk reduction strategies. This came from Alison. Um, what, what role, because we sort of preface that the risk reduction strategies are also management strategies. Um, would you like to preface what you're about to say with regard to management um, uh, as we go through the next slides to answer Alison's question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess um, when we started initially talking about the brain health and we talked about the fact that it's never too early or never too late to start um, looking at brain health and thinking about those risk factors because not only are these factors um, about preventing or reducing the risk of um, dementia, they're also um, associated with slowing down progression. So that's exactly right with um, what Alison had said, that we sort of still look at those across the context of um, slowing down progression. So for someone who is in stage one, you would want to be um, quite focused about those modifiable um, risk factors. And in terms of the souvenade and nutritional supplements, there is quite a lot of mounting evidence in support of um, the Mediterranean diet and lots of greens, you know, lots of your, your kales and spinach and green leafy veg, all those other ones. Souvenade, it, it's really, there's a little bit of a, um, I guess, pretty small studies. Yeah, there's some that suggest that if you take it every day for three years, that there is some benefit but it doesn't replace good diet. So really what we'd want to be doing is looking at diet first. I mean, I think if I had a diagnosis of dementia, I would probably try anything, you know, but um, in terms of can we recommend with 100% evidence that Suvenade will make a difference, we're not quite there yet. So always think about the basics first and think about um, just the good diet and, you know, Mediterranean diet is really Reducing the Reducing alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, exercise, or, you know, the good old regular yeah. things, which we're going to work through in a minute, as well as we're going to work through the anticholinesterase inhibitors, uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which I know is the question on every GP's lips, uh, because it always is, and we are coming there, and you'll see they have a small role to play. But let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny. And... Uh, I reckon, Marita, you can keep going talking about the things that we can do for things to help, we... yeah, for Anna's cognition. Yeah, so I guess if we have a look there, we're thinking about what was what were Anna's issues, and so there was some forgetfulness. Um, she does have some short-term memory loss. 
um, a bit of the repetitive questioning. She did talk about the fact that she wasn't um, going out so much to bridge anymore. She'd sort of withdrawn um, from the garden. And so, you know, there were those changes that we're thinking about. So in terms of cognition, we're going to go back to all those modifiable risk factors. So you can see their cardiovascular risk reduction, risk reduction. And that's the thing about this risk reduction approach. Even though we're focusing it in on brain health today, it is going to reduce cardiovascular disease. It is going to reduce risk of stroke. And it's going to reduce risk of cancer. So you're getting a lot of bang for buck with these modifiable risk factors. Medication review. So we always want to look if there's any medication that could be worsening uh, Anna's cognition. But I think from memory, she was on perindopril and paracetamol. So it was probably going to be unlikely. We want to be able to encourage her to keep going out to bridge and keep um, participating in those activities. And that might be, you know, um, thinking about what, what is the challenge that she's finding with bridge? Is it because she can't remember people's names or is it because she's forgetting how to play the game? And that might be having someone go with her, having a little board where you could put people's names, you know, the team members' names with photos you know, things that could, will help her keep engaged. Educating the carers is really important. And having had a father with dementia and watching how my mother tried to navigate that space was really um, tricky because she, of course, thought she was doing all the right things, like continually reminding him of things or continually telling him not to do things or not to say things, whereas really being able to educate that you you, you don't want to be making it more stressful the, for the person with dementia. So getting some tips. And if anyone out there who's listening to, to what I'm talking about now, they might want to put into the chat box what kind of people or what kind of allied health professionals might be able to help us um, with some of those things. We do have legal affairs and advanced care planning. We get a lot of feedback from consumers uh, living with dementia that the last thing they want their GP to say is, uh, you've got dementia, now you better go away and get your will sorted and your advanced care plan and go away on a holiday while you still can. People find that incredibly confronting. So whilst they're very important things to bring up, it's probably um, useful to do that sort of over time. And again, if we're thinking about things like advanced care planning, we probably should be trying to again do that a little bit earlier. But I'm a busy GP and I know how hard it is um, to do those things as well. But probably not in your first uh, session of giving the diagnosis to raise those. And then we can move on to the um, dementia-specific medications, which I think are on the next slide. Are they, Jenny? Yeah, so the medications, um, as we've said from the outset, there is no curative treatment. These aren't curative. They can at best slow things down for some patients. They're not going to make a big difference for, for a huge number of patients. But certainly um, someone who is at home, independent, perhaps with not a lot of support um, carers around, it might mean that it can slow, slow the illness down enough to be able to stay at home that big that bit longer. So we have a really lovely um, old age psychiatrist who we worked with in with developing the educational material. And he said, it's like tuning up your car so it, run, so it runs at 100 k's an hour instead of 97 k's per hour. So it's a modest benefit, but for some people that modest benefit may be um, enough to keep them at home and independent for longer. So the anticholinesterase inhibitors generally have to be initiated in consultation with a specialist. So that doesn't mean the patient needs to see the specialist, but if you could ring the specialist up and say, um, I've got this patient, Anna, she's presented with the four inclusion criteria that we talked about. She doesn't have any of the exclusion criteria that we've talked about. She um, looks like she could have Alzheimer's dementia because remember these medications are for Alzheimer's. And um, I was going to give her a try on one of these medications. Are you happy for me to go ahead? And you, could, you can certainly do it that way. Generally, they're very well tolerated um, and starting low and sort of building up um, slowly is the best way to do that. So if we go on to the next slide. 
Jenny. This is a mamantine or a Bixa, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, probably not used as commonly as um, the, uh, the other ones. Um, there's different, different PBS criteria for this and that you have to have a MMSE between 10 and 14, not just um, above 10. And there's some thought that these can um, benefit in terms of um, helping the patient, I get helping the carer be able to better look after the person living with dementia rather than really making a big change in cognition. You can use these together. And again, I often think of myself, if I had dementia, I'd probably want to try everything I could, but one would need to be on a private script. These medications aren't that expensive anymore. And if we move on to the next slide, I think that was really just that reminder to really have a good look at the medications that can um, cause cognitive change. And that's a really extensive list and lots of things I'd never thought of. For example, an NSAID that that could have, uh, you know, contribute to um, poor cognition. Um, but remember, a lot of our patients who are over 75 will often be on three, four, five medications. So you can see how there can be this additive um, impact. So if we can have a look broadly, remember, we've got our pharmacist colleagues who can help us do the home medication reviews. And with the specific question, you can ask around cognition and start to think about which ones you might be able to um, lose at that point in time. And I think the, the next slide, which will hopefully be the last slide I'm talking to you for a bit, that's a really good toolkit that's called the Stop Start Cool Toolkit, which looks at prescribing in older people and which medications um, you might want to think about stopping and indeed which ones that you might want to be looking at um, initiating. And it comes out of the UK context, but quite a useful tool. Thanks, Marita. You can definitely have a breather now. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to uh, in the functional domain or impaired function. And Karen, we had a question uh, from uh, Kylie. Would uh, no, from Tamara, around referral to an occupational therapist for assistance. And it was very timely because that's kind Perfect of exactly time. what we're getting on to. Um, and uh, so just again, before you run through this, also thanks, Desley, for suggesting that a mental health social worker might be helpful, particularly for the both the carers and the patients. So that's a very holistic way of thinking about how people can be supported. So Karen, can you run us through some of the things that an OT or other allied health professionals might be able to help with in terms of function? Absolutely. So we said that, you know, some of it is around, particularly in stage one, helping people remain as independent uh, for as long as they can. And so certainly OT assessments, not just in driving, but in some of the other areas of function is really useful. So that home hazards assessment um, is certainly worth thinking about. We know if Anna's really struggling with cooking, we might want to think about is it safe for her still to have her gas or you know her, her cooktop actually still attached. Keep in mind though, microwaves are equally as dangerous because my 96 year old grandmother managed to set her kitchen in a light uh, accidentally cooking a heat bag for 20 minutes instead of two so microwaves are not necessarily any safer but starting to think about you know how do we organize meals do we need to think about um, that support around cooking or meals on wheels or has she got family or neighbors who can who can help out the family education around some of those functional changes um, is certainly really useful and that might be done through the GP, it might be done through things like the support groups. Um, and I know some of my patients' families have found, and patients themselves have found that the dementia support groups to be invaluable um, with, again, just finding out more about what's available and what they can do. Uh, boards on walls, you know, with names or dates or what's happening. There's lots of sort of little tips and tricks that people find help depending on what the functional change is 
and that social interaction is really important and that might be having a carer or a family member taking them out somewhere um, certainly you know you might have community care that can come and help them go shopping for example or taking them to to social activities i've got a young fellow who is only in his 50s with a dementia diagnosis who loves cycling and um, if he goes anywhere apart from the route he knows, he gets lost now and he can't use his phone GPS to work out where he is. So his family have, you know, the find my phone so that they can ring him and keep an eye on where he's got to. They will go with him if he wants to go on a different route, but they've also set up a bike a stationary bike at home that they're getting him used to so that when it comes a time where it might not be safe for him to go cycling that he can actually keep doing what he enjoys which is that physical activity so lots of different ways around um, you know improving people's function and maintaining independence um, as long as possible that's great Desley so in Geelong Care Gateway um, can be helpful as well providing counselling so we're probably going to come back to driving because I know you yes. put it at the top, but that's always the one uh, yeah. thing that so we that's really coming need to be up aware next. of. That's, so it's your turn to have a long monologue, Karen, as we walk right. through driving. So yes, driving is complicated. A diagnosis of dementia does not mean though that somebody automatically loses their license, but it does mean we need to really assess their safety on the roads as well. And having that early conversation is useful. In fact, I probably start having it in Queensland, we have to do driving assessments from 75. So I start having the conversation at that point, as well as if they have a diagnosis of dementia about at some point, you know, when you can't drive, how are we going to look at getting you around? So as is written there, it definitely needs to be noted that they've got a medical condition on the driver's license um, if you feel that they're they're safe to drive and if you're concerned then you definitely need advice we might move on to the next slide so we've said that MMSE is not a good diagnostic tool it's also not a good predictor of how safe you are driving if you're under 20 though, you probably shouldn't be driving, but above that, it doesn't really help us make a decision. So, so sorry, do... Karen, you mean under 20 years of age, you shouldn't be driving or under... <laughs> Well, maybe that too, looking at... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My son's getting to that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Under 20, MMSC of under 20, as yeah. written there, Hilton. Yeah, yeah. Um, Really, people shouldn't be driving. So I guess the... Things that we do know um, give us a good idea is, is in the history, uh, history of accidents or near misses actually gives good correlation to probably being unsafe. So that's always worth asking about um, in the history side of things. MOCA is probably better and that's probably because it has some of these extra evidence-based tests around driving in it. So has anyone played with the trail making A or B? Type in the chat box if you have. I'm now getting all my over 75s to do these. I think they're really useful and we'll show you in a sec how they look if you haven't done it. And it really- What are you finding, Karen, now that you're doing it with, with people as part of their 75 driving? I'm picking up a few people that I wasn't aware that might have some issues actually. So we know that it's a time-based test. So you've got both time and um, being correct. So the longer you take or the more errors you make, the more you might be seen to be unsafe or at least need an OT assessment. Um, and particularly the trail making B, it's, it is complicated. You know, you have to actually task switch. So the, the A is just following the numbers, which is just there. And that's the little sample that you get to do before the main page that the, the patient gets given. So they just draw a line from... from one, one, two, three, four, five, not lifting their pen preferably, but some of them do, but again, just following the numbers around until you get to the end. Trail B, they have to actually switch. So they've go one A, two B, three C, all the way through to I, I think it is. Um, so they've got to be able to hold the task in mind and then switch between the tasks. So it's actually reasonably, you know, as close as we can get in a quick test in our room as to whether there's any issues around that 
holding the task and task switching. So if you do it in under two minutes, and most of us, if you do it, will do it in under one minute and don't and make less than two errors, then you're probably safe on the roads. If you're taking sort of two to three minutes and making two to three errors, you probably do need an OT assessment and you're probably safe to drive for that OT assessment. If you take more than three minutes or make more than three errors, you're probably actually going to fail your OT assessment. So you're going to think about whether it's even uh, going to be worth sending people for that assessment at that point. You can also use the clock drawing test. So that gives us a bit of an idea about that constructional dyspraxia. So one of our sort of screening assessments. And again, I've had someone recently who had to use her clock and still got the numbers wrong. So that was unexpected. So I'm now starting for all of my over 75s doing the GP mini cog, which is our three short term memory tests, uh, the clock drawing test, and then the trail making B as part of my driving assessment. And I'm going to be interested down the track if I do a mini audit just to see how that actually changes for people because I'm documenting that along the way. So they're much better predictions than your mini mental is as far as driving. But if there's any concerns with those or you're just not sure, then the next step is an OT assessment. And I think that's on the next slide, which is both an opportunity to see how safe they are on the road, but also an opportunity to find out if there's areas that they can improve on. So my young patient that I was talking about before, he's been seen by the OT. And again, at the moment, uh, I don't think he'll pass his one that he's due for, I suspect that's that's coming to an end because he's had a significant injury. So that's that's going to stop him driving. But up until that, he was doing OK. But they noticed if he had to go, you know, somewhere that he was a little bit unsure, he you know, he needed to have someone with him to confirm directions. So that just became what got written on his driver's license may call, you know, must have a passenger if going, you know, unfamiliar route. Um, there's only very comprehensive assessments. Um, and so they go through both an off-road assessment around cognition. A lot of them in Brisbane now are using um, Drive Safe Drive Aware, which is a, a computerized program to actually simulate seeing pedestrians and bicycles and other things on the road and whether they actually notice them as part of that assessment. So that becomes also that off-road assessment and then they put them in the car with a usually with a dual um, pedals so that again they can safely assess and say whether they think they're going to be safe or not a lot of people do complain about the cost of this but it does become part of the cost of driving so along with your registration and you know your insurance and your petrol if you wish to mm. keep driving an OT assessment is going to be necessary. And in fact, for my young guy, because I was concerned that he was going to progress quickly, we did that every six months. So he passed two, but I don't think he'll actually make it to his third one. And we interviewed an OT driving assessor for our fantastic podcast called Dementia in Practice. And it was so interesting speaking with Matt because he was speaking about the role that an OT can play in enablement rather than failing people. It's like to help them play to their strengths rather than focusing on their weaknesses. Uh, and that's why an early diagnosis and early assessment can be helpful. The other thing that he said to me is, Hilton, please, 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 if you think someone's not safe to drive, don't send them for a driving test with the licensing authority driving tester, mm -hmm. because they don't do the initial off-road assessment to see if they're actually safe to get behind the wheel. That puts the person at risk as well as the, uh, the licensing authority um, tester at risk. So that it's probably not a safe thing to do. And I think depending on where you are and what's available, having that discussion around what would happen if you can't drive, um, because by the time you add up all the costs of being on a car, it's actually an awful lot of um, taxi fares, which often with dementia you can get subsidies. Uh, certainly, you know, you might have community drivers that might be able to assist or family. So 
uh, often often people end up, although they feel they've lost independence, they often end up financially better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was the issue with my father when he had dementia as well. It was difficult, but we got there in the end and financially it was definitely better. Um, I think before we go on with the slides, I just, um, Marita and Karen, let's just have a think of some of these questions because there've been some good mm. questions. So, um, Marita, I'm going to throw to you for this one first. Um, Desley's asked, when people become increasingly disabled by dementia and not able to recognise their limitations, families are often seen as the enemy. Have you had lived experience with that? Uh, yes, family and doctors often become the, often become the enemy. Um, and it does become uh, really tricky. And I think um, over the years of having the lived experience um, and also being the doctor in the family and um, having the opportunity to, to talk to um, other people who care for people um, living with dementia, it's sort of that, that, that ongoing balance, isn't it, of how do you look after someone who's sort of fighting or <laughs> resisting and you, can, and you can understand why that is because it is pretty undignified and it does feel like a lot of things are kind of um, being taken or are at risk of being taken away from you, selling the house, moving into nursing home care, that's what everyone thinks. So I think um, it is often uh, what I've found is sort of having that balance and whilst we always want to keep the person living with dementia central to, to any process. Sometimes it's weighing up um, conversations that actually might be very difficult for that person with dementia to hear. And for, for in, my, in my practice, most of the time, I have found that um, being able to educate the families about what's going on, because families often um you know get get confused and distressed and will often tend to blame the person with dementia you know they know what they're doing they just you know every time I come around they know that I'm coming but they do this and that or the other or um I had one woman who her daughter-in-law would want to come around and help clean and she she'd come and you know first thing she'd do is start wiping down all the bench and the, the, my patient with dementia could say to me she didn't like that because she felt like the daughter was making out that she wasn't clean and was questioning her hygiene. Now, her hygiene wasn't great, but it was trying to kind of get that balance between how can we help the person without feeling like, you know, we're making them feel worse about the situation. So what we did in the end was when you get there don't that's not the first thing you do kind of say your hellos go and talk to the cat go out into the garden then when things are calm then maybe start going and helping in terms of cleaning up but there does tend to be this incredible tension that can be really hard to balance and you know we can't always um a hundred percent keep that person there sometimes we do have to have some side discussions you know, away from the person uh, to work out the best approach. But it's very hard. It's very hard, like it is hard with all conditions where the person doesn't have a great deal of insight and yeah. we're trying to do what's best for them. But without that insight, it, it can be quite challenging. So, Desley, I'm afraid there are no easy answers, but the overall uh, thing about dignity and keeping the person with who's living with dementia central to the thinking is the thing that's that's really key. And also not forgetting the personal, psychological and physical mental health needs of family and carers as well, because we know that taking care of the carers is good for the people living, the, the, it's, it's also good for the people that they're caring for. So um, having time with them separately to meet their needs is also really important. Um, Karen, I, I know you're interested and in, because you were one of our guests on Dementia in Practice, that brilliant podcast that I mentioned earlier about end of life care for people with dementia. And there was a question about deprescribing, any red flags that you think about when deprescribing as a person's moving towards the end of their journey with dementia? 
Certainly, in once people are in residential care, I often look at what the medications they are on, um, because we know that things like even things like hydrostatins, uh, you know, some of the evidence around some of our medications at that point uh, certainly are reduced. So looking at what they're on is certainly worth considering. When they get to stage three, where we're really looking at being very bed bound and being highly dependent for everything, I'd certainly want to be looking at deprescribing at that point. Um, and often we find the swallow is an issue, so it's another good incentive to deprescribe. But as far as flags for when, that third stage definitely consider, but even just a, a move to a residential aged care, I would be looking at, at what they are on because our goals of care are suddenly changing. So we're suddenly not interested as much in you know, keeping them independent and well, we're really looking at that safety and then comfort. So that's probably when I would, the two times, both stage two-ish and three-ish is when I would look at it. Yeah, and having those conversations early about what's important to the person, what yeah. what gives their life meaning. And uh, I remember very well a conversation I had with uh, one of my long-term patients on upon admission to a residential aged care facility. She had pretty significant dementia. So like if we were doing the MMSE, she wouldn't know what day it was. She wouldn't know who the prime minister was. She could not remember John West 43, whatever straight. She would not remember any of those things at all. But when we got to a conversation around the level of care that she wanted, if there was ever a situation uh, where there was no hope of her improving, she said, well, if my number's up, my number's up. And there's no point in prolonging things. And that's exactly what she has always said throughout the 10 or 15 years that I'd known her. So that deeply held belief remained strong throughout. So deprescribing for her around dignity and comfort was so much easier because we'd had those conversations early on. Marita, do you want to tackle the challenging question about aspirin if there are microvascular changes on CT, apart from wishing you hadn't done the CT in the first place? I, know, I was just thinking that, God damn it. Um, yeah, look, I'd, I don't know about aspirin. What I do know is that if someone's got some signs of microvascular disease, they've got a risk factor for dementia and they're in their midlife. So I'd go back to my 12 modifiable risk factors and invite them to consider doing the COGD risk to look at their personal risk profile and actually work at the things that we know might make a difference. I had someone like this who saw a neurologist uh, a couple of years ago who suggested that aspirin was not going to make any difference. She decided to take it anyway. And last year she had a nice GI bleed So in her 50s. So, you know... She hasn't had any working, working with what we know, and we definitely know about about those risk factors. And yeah, you know, and the risk of doing physical exercise, uh, or reducing alcohol, or losing weight are probably lower than the risk of taking aspirin every day. So uh, less likely to do harm. Um, Jenny, I'm looking at the clock and I know we've got a few slides to go. Thank you to those of you who've asked the questions. We're happy to keep answering questions, but we're also happy to plow through the slides. So if you want us to stop plowing through the slides, ask us questions. Otherwise, we will continue until about 8.28 and then we'll turn the slides off and everyone's going to go home. So let's go to the next slide, please, Jenny, if you can even remember. So, Marita, it must be your turn, I think, to talk about the things that we might do for someone with a dementia around uh, mental health and the psychiatric domain. Yeah, and I think probably, again, um, a point you alerted, alluded to, Hilton, earlier is to please don't forget the carer because we do know that carers are under a lot of stress. And remember, most of the care is done by uh, women and often it's done while they're trying to juggle work adult kids at home potentially grandchildren potentially you know um uh, a partner who's who's not well you know trying to get their super built up all sorts of things going on and now they've also got this this incredibly um i suppose intense 
disease process, so a person that they love who's going through this process that they've also got to try and make sense of, which is really hard. So don't forget the carer. And if, if you're not their GP, you know, reminding them to, to perhaps see their GP. So with, with any of the um, potential psychiatric symptoms, we talked about them waxing and waning um, in and out, uh, incredibly important to optimise, you know, their mental health is if there is any depression to to treat that as best you can. And sometimes when you're caring for someone with dementia and there is increased anxiety or depression or we're starting to see some of the more um, difficult symptoms like the hallucinations and delusions coming in, that's sometimes where you might need to seek some help from, from colleagues as well. We do know that a lot of people with dementia are going to experience your hallucinations and, and delusions um, at some point in time. And again, sometimes they're going to be scarier for the carer than the person um, actually having them. I think one of the big things um, to think about is if there is any sudden change. Um, so if there is any sort of sudden onset of a delusion, hallucination or, or mood change, to think about could there be any um, concurrent a illness that the person can't tell you about so they can't tell you that they've got dysuria for example um, so could there be a UTI so could there be could this be a, a, a sign that there could be a delirium that's occurring because that's often where we will see some of those changes and I've certainly had quite a few patients who um, you know have ended up in hospital because we haven't quite figured out the, the subtleties of those deliriums at start so um, the PHN up on the northwest coast actually did develop an excellent delirium action plan, which I think is our next slide. And I think Western Victoria have an older version of this. But I think this is a really useful tool, just like we have a um, diabetes sort of sick day plan or we have an allergy action plan or an asthma action plan. Early on, um, in, and if we make a timely diagnosis, it's really useful to be able to spend a little bit of time sitting down with the person living with the dementia and their carers to go through what delirium actually is and what to look out for and have a system in place. I don't know how you work it in your practice, but for me, I have two sort of golden rules with reception. If someone over the age of 65 is unwell or under the age of five is really unwell, I have to see them or know about them on that day because we know how sick um, either end of the spectrum can get quite quickly and I prefer to know about that earlier. So even if it means it's the I've got no appointments, it's a conversation with the nurse, the nurse can get come and grab me and then I can make a decision about how, how we might progress. So this is a really useful tool that will hopefully prevent um, hospitalizations because of course that's about the worst place um, for someone with dementia uh, to end up and you know their their regression can be that great in hospital with a delirium that's really hard to get them back to where they were before that. And there's probably some people on the webinar tonight who work in hospitals and uh, I'm just imagining that you probably prefer if you didn't have too many people with dementia and delirium on your hospital wards. And if there were things that we could do to help keep people out of hospital, then that would be so much better for everyone because the uh, people with dementia already have a reduced cognitive reserve and a delirium can significantly, uh, an untreated delirium can significantly uh, exacerbate that reduction in cognitive reserve and um, yeah, I think the um, mortality rate after a significant delirium is pretty high. Uh, so it's a real, it's a warning sign we need to be aware of. I'm mindful of time. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny. So um, with regard to behaviours, Karen, you're the behaviours expert. So we'll just put your mobile number up on the screen <laughs> in a minute. And if any of you have any people living with dementia who are exhibiting behaviours of concern, you can just ring Karen. But failing her answering, could you give us some other things that might be helpful? So as we said, there's kind of the two types of behaviours. So this really is looking at our stage one because we're still at home and in the community, some of the behaviours that we might see and that sort of agitation and frustration just with not being quite sure of what's going on is certainly very 
very common and that's where routine makes a big difference so being able to help people know what's happening and know what's going on and keep engaged does certainly help with that I found when all else fails with apathy that's when actually our anticholinesterase or acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are actually uh, quite useful uh, with the apathy side of things but education makes a difference uh, we've talked about speech path or OT looking at some of those tools uh, that might be able to help around the home um, again just keeping people in routine and keeping people knowing what's happening and then respite certainly is useful for, for carers as well as social connection uh, for our patients living with dementia when we're thinking about uh, nursing home and behaviours in stage two and three, then there's a whole other toolkit and a whole other webinar that we need for that. Yeah, and given that we don't have time for that, let's go on to the next slide, please, Jenny. Um, if you are caring for people uh, in stage two or three where there are really uh, behaviours that are causing distress for either the person or the carers, uh, Dementia Support Australia uh, is, uh, is available to help. 24 seven. So with some phone contact and actually a visiting service to uh, communities, uh, both urban and rural. In Brisbane, Let's, they've stopped visiting. They're only doing it by telehealth at the moment. Are they? Just, mm. So many things are wrong with being in Queensland. <laughs> I know. Just add that to the list, right, Karen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. I'm mindful the clock's ticking by. Um, a lot of these we've already spoken about, haven't we, Marita? Is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you'd like to add? I think um, dental check we haven't spoken about. And again, that's a really good thing to do early on because it can be really quite difficult, uh, you know, later on when someone doesn't understand perhaps the process of someone wanting to put their hand or put tools into someone's mouth. So getting a dental check to know that things are um, as optimal as possible. And actually the vision is another really interesting one. And Dementia Australia of I think they've just about finished a study with the optometrists looking at how they can be more provide more dementia friendly um, visual screening. So vision and hearing are really important to make sure that you're optimizing um, someone's you know cognition and ability to be able to be socially engaged and do all those things they like. So I think um, keep remembering those things are super, super important. And immunisation as well. And then we've got our falls risk and exercise, which again, we're talking about allied health before, but getting yeah. our physios involved, because uh, again, often around the type of diagnosis, we might have weight loss, uh, we might have frailty and all of that increases your risk of morbidity. So that's also some extra things we can add in. Yeah, if only the um, GP management plan allowed for more than five allied health visits for people with dementia. We're actually been trying to lobby for that, uh, both in terms of uh, mental health and uh, allied health, but we haven't had any great success yet. Uh, so Jenny, next slide. I know there've been plenty of non-GPs in the audience tonight, and uh, some of you will be a part of these groups that are on the screen now. And, and I hope that you felt that what we've offered has been a more generalistic view of the sort of people and strategies that might help someone like Anna who is uh, is experiencing and, and living with dementia. Um, and may your referrals go up in exactly the appropriate way that you would like to see it happen given the amount of um, capacity that you may or may not have for taking on new clients. But it's really, we talk about dementia being a whole person condition, a whole family and a whole of community condition. And uh, I think this list really highlights that. We've also uh, added Dementia Australia, which is around supporting uh, people living with dementia and their family and carers. And we've mentioned Dementia Support Australia, which is a help around behaviours. 
we're from Dementia Training Australia. It's so confusing. All the money comes from the Commonwealth, but there are these different organisations that have different logos, but very similar sort of names. Let's go into the next slide, please, Jenny. Uh, those other blue slides were part of a GP management plan for stage one dementia. The whole thing is there on the screen. You're not expected to read it, but really what we've done is use the domains to help guide how we might help a person who's living with dementia. We've got similar management plans for stage two and stage three dementia. Let's go on to the next slide, Jenny. So that's where we started and it's fairly close to where we'll end. Uh, um, uh, let's go on to the next one, please. And Marita, would you like to speak about? Oh yeah, this is great. This is a um, education day that's coming up. It's part of the um, ADNET uh, research, um, which is the Australian Dementia Network Research Forum. So it's kind of, you know, Australia's big research conference uh, around dementia. So it's where all the hobnobs will be. But the first day is an education day, a CPD day, and that's um, something that can be attended up on the Gold Coast or virtually. So I thought that might be something of interest if you're really wanting to hear about the latest and greatest, what's going on, all the new upcoming info about disease modifying treatments, blood biomarkers. We'll be talking risk reduction and how to detect um, cognitive change in primary care, but something worth having a look at and seeing if you'd like to just even attend the, the day virtually for the the education day. Yeah, because no one in Victoria would want to go to the Gold Coast on the 29th of May. Why would you want to leave beautiful, balmy Victoria for the Gold Coast at the end of May? Um, you, you can do it remotely. Um, Karen, I know um, you care for a lot of people in nursing homes. There was a question from Peter about immunisation. I just wonder what your thoughts and experiences have been regarding immunisation for people as they're really moving towards the end of their life. Yeah, and it really depends um, where they are in that trajectory. Certainly in that stage two and even early stage three where people are still relatively well. Um, the one that we've up until in the last few years typically offered each year is influenza vaccination. And partly it's for the good of everybody else in the facility and partly it is because having fevers and a cough and things is actually really unpleasant so a, a needle has actually been better in some ways than that but again we say i certainly have residents whose family choose not to have them vaccinated and that's totally fine um so yeah it, it really depends on on how well they are how mobile they are still and and what their family's feelings are yeah, thank you. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, Marita and Karen, thank you so much for your input. Jenny, thanks for managing the slides. The three, my three colleagues are so much more cleverer than me and they've got that beautiful background, which my computer that was made in about 1975 doesn't allow me to have. And um, behind them, you'll see the plug for Dementia in Practice podcast, which uh, if you want to learn more about dementia and you like podcasts, I highly recommend it, as you all know. And on the DTA website, there is a primary care and GP resource hub as well. So, Whitney, I'll hand it back to you to um, wrap things up, if you'd like. Yes, thank you, Hilton. That was um, very well done. And um, us all out here at Westwick PHN really appreciate your time and Marita and Karen, your time, and especially you, Jenny. I would like to thank you in particular for all your help in organising um, this training. It's been really well received, and yeah, we really appreciate your time and effort. That you've Absolute put into pleasure. It. Thanks for having us.